double check. In the past, you know, sometimes I forget to double check to make sure the screen recording is actually using this microphone instead of the internal sound card. If it's using an internal sound card, all you can hear when you watch it would be just you know static noise, you know, electrical static noise. So that would not be very helpful. So let me just double check on that. Um, and it's showing, it's, it's uh, capturing the, the audio from that little microphone over there. So everything is good. And we are ready to get started with the class. Um, <coughs> there are some additional chairs. If you want to, you can just you know pull a chair and you know just sit down somewhere. You can sit next to here. But there's one chair over here as well. Okay, so this is CISP 300, and um, I'm assuming that some of you are taking this class because you are on the computer science track you're trying to get a computer science degree. And that can get you to uh, EE and also computer science you know, after you get out of here. Um, I'm also assuming some of you are in engineering programs. Is that correct? OK. How many people are in an engineering program of some kind? OK. Not counting CS, not counting computer science. OK. So there's still, what, what type of uh, engineering discipline are you are you guys going after? Yes. Electrical. Sorry? Electrical? Civil engineering. Civil? Any mechanical? Yeah. Mechanical? Okay. So why do you think you need to take a programming class or a few programming classes even though you're not in computer science? Because the world is becoming more and more computerized. The world is becoming much more computerized than we ever anticipated. Okay? Um, you know, just as an example, how many people watch Star Trek just occasionally? I, I'm not talking about 100% dedicated trackies here. Just, you know, watch Star Trek once in a while, okay? Um, the old Star Trek and also the new Star Trek, right? The old Star Trek. Um, what does the communicator look like in the old Star Trek? How big is it? Okay, it's not humongous, but it, it's about the size of a cell phone, right? And can we use you know, our cell phones about that size now? Yeah. Okay. How about the new one? They have a communicator, which is kind of like a badge. How big is your Bluetooth headset? It's about that size. Okay. So things are definitely moving very quickly, you know, to into to that direction. Okay. How many computers do you think you know every car has? You know, let's say we're talking about a 2011. Uh, kind of vehicle, and let's not go fancy. It's not a Lexus. Just go for you know Hyundai um, um, Accent, okay, which is the least expensive you know car you can get from Hyundai. How many computers do you think is on board that that particular car? I would say half a dozen at least. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say five minimum. But yeah, about half a dozen. Um, there's one for engine control. There's one for anti-lock brakes. There's one for the navigation unit, if you have one. Uh, one for the radio. Um, one for temperature control, if you know, temperature, temperature control is an, is an option. And so on and so forth. So there are many, many computers now on every single vehicle. Um, but you don't see them, OK? Um, let's see. Well, this reminds me to turn off my cell phone. Let me ask you one thing. What is this? Is a smartphone, and how would you describe a smartphone? What is a smartphone? Computer. Aha, I heard that. That was a very good answer. This is a computer. It's a computer pretending to be a phone. Okay? It's a phone, but that's one of its minor duties. Okay? Yeah, I can double as a phone, but it really is a computer. Okay. Um, what do you think you know, this computer can do that the other computer cannot do? Sorry? Make phone calls. Make phone calls. Well, I can do Skype you know, on the other one too. Yep. Mobility. Portability. Are there any devices that are on this phone or on this computer that is missing on the main desktop computer? Uh, that could like CDMA or SIP networks. OK. Touch screen. Accelerometer. Mm -hmm. um, a camera built into it. Okay, and some phones, many phones now have two cameras, one facing out and one facing in. Um, microphone is built in. 
um, speaker is built into this phone, um, GPS is built into this phone, and so on and so forth. Wi-Fi is built into this phone. That computer has wired in uh, network access, but it does not have Wi-Fi. So if you think about it that way, your cell phone, and this is not even a fancy cell phone, okay? So it's a Byte, it's a Google phone, uh, My Touch 3G, you know, so by today's standard, it's almost two years old already, and it's quite obsolete by today's standard. And yet it already has all that, you know, all those resources that is missing from a desktop computer. All right, so let me just make sure that I turn off the ringer, and you should do the same in the class. Um, if you are expecting some important calls or someone to send you a message that is important, you can keep it on, but turn it into vibrate only in, during the class, okay? If you need to carry on a conversation, if it's important, you can walk outside of the classroom, you know, finish your conversation and then walk back in. I do not mind that. Um, it's just that, you know, during the class, you know, I don't want people to be answering the phone or have the phone ringing during the class. Yes? CISP 300, okay. Um, just pull a chair and you know, put it next to a, a desk or something, um, because you know we are <laughs> we have a long wait list here you know, for this class, so we'll deal with that later. All right. So the first thing you want to do with this class is to know where you can find the resources. There's no textbook for you to buy, which can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. Okay. I have heard people complaining about it. And I've heard people saying, oh, that's good, you know, that's really cool. I don't have to spend money on a textbook. So all the resources that you need are on Moodle. If you're new to Moodle, you should have received a message from the uh, SumProf server saying that you are taking at least one class on that server, and it will give you your account name, which is your student ID without the W, as well as your initial password, which is a you know, random six-letter kind of thing. How many people have received that message? Very good. And do you think you can log into Moodle without any problems? Okay. So let's just say that you somehow misplaced that message. Okay. You deleted that message, you know, accidentally. So you have just lost your initial password. If you lost your initial password, it's not a big deal. Okay. Because you can always reset your password. And that's the first thing I want to talk about: is how to reset your password. Okay, so if you forget your password, you can click lost password, okay? But instead of doing that, I will just point you to a video clip that will help you reset your password. It is on this side here. I'm not even logged in, so this resource is available to you even before you log in, which makes sense. It's this item here, how to reset a password. It's a video clip. You just have to watch that video clip. It will show you exactly how to reset your password. Okay, so if you forget it, you know, it's not a big deal, you know, there's always a way to reset it. You do need to make sure your, that your email account is working. Or whatever email account that your G, uh, email is forwarding to, that has to be a working email address. That's the only requirement. Yep? Do you know when those messages went out? Um, it probably went out early this morning at about 8 o'clock or so. So by the time, you know, after this class, you should, you know, have received that. You know, most people receive it probably at 9, 8.30 or something like that. Okay. All right. So I'm going to log in as myself and go to the class's website. I never save password in a browser, not for security reasons, but so, so that I do not forget my own password. <laughs> Right? If you let your browser remember the passwords, you know, you know, sooner or later, probably in two weeks, you'll forget your, some of your passwords. And I never let my browser remember my passwords for that reason. All right. So you will also see, you know, on the left-hand side, you will see my courses. Now, obviously, you won't see a long list like the one that I have. You will probably only see CISP 300 as the only link on the left-hand side unless you're taking other classes that are also offered through Moodle. Now Moodle is not D2L, okay? So there's nothing like, you know, D2L with Moodle. And it's a different type of interface, but I think most of you can navigate through this you know, without a whole lot of problems. The first thing we'll do is to go through the syllabus. The syllabus comes in two formats. One is PDF. If you want to print out something and put it into a binder, you want to print out the PDF version. It is good for printing. 
the HTML version you can also use it for printing purposes, you know, but I use it you know, just for you know in class presentations mostly. So we can pick either one, they have exactly the same content. And where did it open it? There we go. The nice part about an HTML version is I can change the font size and everything will flow automatically. Alright, so let's quickly, you know, I'll try to get through this as quickly as we can. The class code is 12208. If you're adding to this class, okay, you know, at the end of the class, I will find out how many spots I have open. And then you need to use this number along with your add permission number to add to this class. The title is algorithm design slash problem solving. And you know, it should ha have a subtitle. The subtitle is, you know, how do you execute a program manually? Because that's basically what we'll do in this class. And we'll go through the description here just a little bit. Introduces methods for solving typical computer problems through algorithm design. That's a lie. <laughs> yes, I wrote that. I actually wrote that. It's, it's kind of a lie because if I can do this in one single lesson, you don't need other lessons. In, you don't need other classes anymore. Okay? Designing algorithms to solve problems is not that easy. Okay? We can deal with simpler problems in this class. Okay? So we can do it in a certain way, but any problem that's worth solving is not going to be you know, easily programmed. So we'll deal with that a little bit. Topics include assessing and analyzing computer problems in a top-down, divide and conquer, divide and conquer approach that leads to a programming solution. So we'll do that. It also covers programming plans and detailed design documents. We are not going to do much of that, from which source code versions of programs are created. I think I have changed this in the syllabus, I mean in the curriculum, since this is um, uh, published. And there are uh, student learning outcomes. Some of these are completely trivial, uh, like defining operators, arithmetic, comparison, and logical operators. Um, how many people are, consider yourself familiar with multiplication, addition, and stuff like that? I mean, so it's done already. Comparison. Okay, less than, greater than, equal to, not equal to. How many people think that you can handle that? All right, very good, two hands. Um, how about logical operators? Now that's a little bit um, into programming logic, but it's nothing more than not, and, or. How many people think that you can use those particular words in English correctly? All right, so it's done. The second one is a little bit more um, complicated. We deal with control structures. So that definitely is a part of the, the core part of this class. Uh, deduce post conditions. Many of you will hate this topic because it involves a lot of mathematics. Okay? And we'll talk about why math is actually important when you're trying to learn how to program. Uh, trace tables, you know, it's kind of tedious, but this is the only way I can know for sure that you know how to follow a program. We won't be writing a lot of programs, but we'll be following the execution of programs a lot in this class. Um, contrast the lifespan limits and behaviors of local variables by value parameters and by reference parameters. Unless you already have done some programming, you know, these words should be fairly, fairly foreign to you. Uh, compare the two methods of passing results by reference parameters and return value. Same thing, it should be fairly uh, foreign unless you have already done some programming before this class. Um, inline copy and paste coding, you know, comparing that with um, structured subroutines. Synthesize subroutines to abstract one or more similar blocks of inline code, and so on. And I got the time incorrect. This is a, I copied it from another course, so forgot to update this. It's Tuesday, Thursday from uh, 1030 to 1150. And this part is probably wrong too, so I'm going to update my <laughs> syllabus. So don't print it out yet, okay? Yeah, I'm going to update it because I'm of this. Now this part is correct, okay? My name is Tech Aoyoung. My first name is Tech and last name is Aoyoung. Um, it's almost unpronounced, uh, it can, it's hard to pronounce because you can see how many vowels are strung, are strung together. 
one, two, three, four, five. And then we have ng as a single consonant at the end. So that makes the name kind of hard to pronounce. If you want to find out you know, more about that last name, it's also a very uncommon you know, Chinese last name. If you think about it, we have 1.6, 1.7 billion Chinese, and this is a fairly uncommon uh, last name you know, among the 1. something billion people. You can right click and just go to Wikipedia, which actually explains the origin of, the, of that last name. <laughs> Or at least, you know, what people think, you know, was the origin of that last name. My office is room seven of Liberal Arts 133. Um, if you just go to another aisle on the other side, um, you will see a glass door, and the glass door is room 133. Once you get into 133, my office is room seven. My phone number is 484-8250 but I prefer people to you know, send email to me instead of calling me, um, especially you know, with stuff regarding your homework assignments and programming in general. My office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays are from um, 5 to 6 o'clock. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's from uh, 9.30 to 10.30, which is right before this class, so that should make it a little bit convenient for you guys. On Fridays, it is online from 1 to 2 o'clock. Um, any questions about this part? It doesn't matter, both will get to me. Uh, and my cell phone actually combined the two accounts into one. So you know either way you send to either one you send to, you know, it will pop up on the on the top. All right. So we're gonna go through you know some of the uh, expectations in the class. Uh, the first one is no disruptive behavior. You know, what does it mean when I, what what do you think I mean when I say disruptive behavior? People talking when I'm talking, especially on stuff that is not related to the class. Yeah. Um, I can understand sometimes, you know, you know, you guys, you know, some people cannot write fast enough or miss a certain point and ask, you know, the neighboring student, okay, what did he, what did he just say, or something like that, and that's that's kind of distracting. But at least it's related to the class. I do not want people to talk about stuff that is unrelated to the class or you know, chit chatting during the class. So if people want to chit chat, they can do it outside. If people want to talk on the phone, they can do it outside. And now sometimes you know, with the classroom this big, I cannot actually see or hear everything. If you feel that you know, there has, there's, there's, there's a student who's disruptive around you and I have not addressed that, let me know and I will address that later or in the following class. Um, I can tell you more examples too. You know, I had one student who brought in his dog you know, during the class. Now there are you know dogs that are useful. You know how do you call those dogs that are, that help the blind people guide dogs, surface dogs. surface dogs, and most of those dogs are very very um, how should I put it? Um, they they are here, but you don't even know they're here. Okay, until you step on his tail, you know you don't even know that they're here. But this dog, this particular dog, was not a helping dog. Okay, it, it's just a regular dog, and it was panting the whole time. Okay, when, when I say panting, I mean loudly. It's like, <laughs> like that, you know, the whole class, you know, during the entire class. And then they would turn around and lick the student behind it. Yeah, I think that's a little bit disruptive. <clears throat> so I had to tell the student, you know, not to bring the dog into the classroom, you know, because it is not, um, it's not helping the other students. It's just a lot, just too disruptive. Okay, this is one item that I added for this semester, you know, no disrespectful behavior. Um, in other words, I don't want to see someone, you know, playing with their, their 3DS, you know, in the back of the classroom or anywhere else. Okay, it doesn't have to be the back, you know, you know I just don't want people to uh, do their own things, you know, during the class because, you know, those people can do it outside of the classroom as well. So when you're in this classroom, I'm teaching and you should be paying attention to what I'm teaching. I understand the 3DS is really fun because I have one too. And I keep telling my kids, it's my 3DS, it's not yours. So they keep asking me, can I borrow it for like half an hour? You know, so that's, a, that, that's good currency right there. <laughs> yeah, you can play with it for 15 minutes if you clean up all the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really fun, um, and that's also one great example of you know, programming. 
because all those games need to be programmed. Somebody has to write the programs on all of these game consoles. And you know, gaming is one big industry now. What do you think would be the revenue comparison between um, the game industry and the movie industry? How much more? Yep. Go ahead. Three times more. I think it's more than, more than three times. It's a lot more. Wow. Yeah. So if you think about it, you know, all these movies must be pulling in a lot of money, right? Because they typically spend, you know, hundreds of, you know, at, you know, they can spend up to hundreds of millions of dollars to produce a movie. And then when you look at the game industry, they pull in, you know, I think at least five times more than the movie industry when it comes to revenue. Okay, so that's one you know direction where things are heading. No, it's not. No. Okay. Seems crazy. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing, um, and I think you know that's it's because games are more active. You're not just you know sitting back and you know watch a movie, but instead you know you can actually participate in the game. Okay, it can be a driving game, can be you know a first first person you know shooter game, can be any type of game, but it's more immersive compared to just watching a movie. And then the other type of you know um, programming that is really hot right now are is mobile programming, okay? Programming you know cell phones, um, tablets, and so on and so forth. You know that's actually becoming one of the um, uh, fuel that's fueling the next boom in uh, computer science and programming. So that's we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more you know when we when it's time to do that. Um, I was uh, talking to one of my colleagues, which I, who I will not name. And he said that you know some of his students played card games during his class, so I, I think that's you know that's definitely falling into this category <laughs> of uh, being disrespectful. Okay, the last one is a long item, or relatively long. Um, academic dishonesty is really bad. You know, basically cheating is really bad, and I will you know I do not tolerate that kind of thing. And here's a link to Wikipedia that will give you a much more complete explanation <laughs> of what academic dishonesty is. So if you look through this stuff here, um, it, it, this talks about you know what what if I catch someone you know being uh, being dishonest in an academic setting. I'm just trying to find out you know where. Okay, let me just click on this link here. The quickest definition of you know, cheating is someone displaying a competency level that that person does not have, and doing so intentionally. Okay, so there's intentional and there's not so intentional. In other words, let me give you an example. I'm really bad at um, art. Okay, you know, so ask me any questions about art, and I would not be able to answer it. So let's just say that I have to take you know, a pop quiz in art history, and it's multiple choice. It is entirely possible, although improbable, that I can pick, just randomly pick all the correct answers, right? So I end up with a score that is not representative of my own competency in art history. But in that case, it's just purely by chance. Now, if I take an art class, and I continuously, not continuously, but I, you know, just you know, quiz after quiz, exam after exam, I also get you know scores like that. That you know, the art hist the art history professor should be a little bit you know, um, suspicious because you know, because I really know nothing about art. Okay, you know, when I'm in a classroom, you know, I'm just dozing off the whole time because I find it you know boring and stuff like that. But when it comes to the exams, I ace every single one. That would be suspicious. Okay, so that's basically what it means when I talk about you know academic dishonesty is any type of um, behavior that will make a particular person display or get a score that is not representative of that person's competency level. Any questions about this part? No. <laughs> Well, I have you know people you know asking that kind of question, or at least my colleagues have encountered a lot of uh, uh, problems with you know uh, people who do not understand what is you know, cheating. Um, my next door neighbor had one particular instance where a student um, she teaches uh, Microsoft Word, okay, you know, so that you know, people know how to use word processing, 
I think it's a one or two unit class, you know, that is not exactly transferable to um, you know, UCs or CSUs. And yet, you know, they have, and students cheat in that class, okay? And the way they cheat is, you know, they turn in, in this case, it's, um, uh, it's a couple, you know, husband and wife. So the, the wife, I cannot remember, and I cannot remember who took, you know, whose homework and turned it in as if it, it is hers or his, but it's from one semester ago. So, you know, one of the, one of the couple, one person of the couple took the class in spring, and when it's time for the second one to take the class in the fall, you know, that person just turned in whatever homework the other one did in spring without changing anything. <laughs> Yeah, that's you know that's kind of extreme, but you know there are people, and then when they were confronted, they said, "I don't think this this is cheating." The students, you know, the students, you know, basically said, "You know, I don't think this is cheating." Nobody told us that this is you know not allowed. <laughs> but do you think you know the second person will get a score that is not representative of that person's competency? Probably. Okay. Okay, so more stuff here. No phone, no drink, no food, and no kid. And I'm just you know, quoting from here. <laughs> so it's not my policy, but it's a policy of the college. Uh, raise your hand and wait for acknowledgement before asking and answering questions. You know, with a class this big, you know, sometimes it can get chaotic, especially when everybody wants to jump in and say, I know the answer of that, which is good. Okay, and there's a section about attendance. Now this becomes more of a problem now than before because I'm doing screen recording of the entire lecture. Okay? The entire one hour and twenty minutes, you know, will be recorded. So some people think, hey, I can just watch YouTube instead of coming to the class. Then I don't have to park find a parking space and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, as much as I want to allow that option, the school, the college, is not you know, allowing that option. This class is classified as a face-to-face -face class, so attendance means you, know, you have to be here in the classroom. I know a lot of good students who want to you know, do that, you know, basically taking the class remotely, but I cannot allow that. I asked the dean already. So maybe you guys can ask you know, the dean and you know, try to convince him that you know, we should allow you know, attendance in either case. So given that is the case, anyone who missed the first class will be dropped. So that means you guys are safe. <laughs> Whoever is listening to this because they missed the first class is probably will be dropped by the time they hear this. <laughs> the second one is 6% um, or more of unexcused absences is considered excessive already and I will drop those people as well. This is a 16 week class. So how many classes do you think someone can miss without any excuse before that person will be dropped? Two. two. Yep. It's a 16-week class, so two classes makes one week. One out of 16 is more than 6% already. Okay? Now, but the key word here is, you know, those are unexcused absences. Okay? If you are sick and you have a doctor's note, you know, to show me after the fact, then it is excused. Okay? I think this part does not really matter. Um, I'm only required, okay, so th these are excuses that I have to accept. Um, military duty, jury duty, and medical reasons, you know, those are the excuses that I have to accept given that it, 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 there's proof of those you know, excuses. All other absences may or may not be excused at my discretion. So if you have something coming up and you think that I might miss that class, you know, on say next Thursday or something like that, let me know. And most of the time, if it's reasonable, I will excuse it. Okay, I, I'm, but I I reserve the right not to, you know, excuse you know uh, certain type of uh, reasons. The campus health center can uh, verify medical excuses. If you want to bring in a, a little slip of paper saying that yes, I got you know a headache or fever or something like that, you know, and I cannot make it to class, um, the Campus Health Center can provide you with that. All right, online stuff, if you want to send me an email, I need certain things on the subject line, including the class number, CISP 300, 
Um, this part is not needed because I'm only teaching one section of this class this semester. Sometimes I teach like three um, sections of the same class, so you have to let me know which class you're in. But this semester is okay. Um, you also have to kind of briefly explain the nature of the email um, so that when I read the subject line in my email, I know you know what the content is going to contain. In the body of the message, you have to give me more details of the question or comment that you want to you know, send me. Um, please do not use texting standards. I can read some of those, but I'm not proficient. <laughs> okay, you know, F W I W, I can get that one. You know, um, I M H O, I can understand you know, some of those, but you know, some of the other ones I don't get. So, so just not you know, use texting standards. Um, I also need your actual name. I have received you know email messages without you know an actual name, and then the email account is something that has no indication of the name. Okay, like Skydiver, you know, 69. Okay, well, do I, am I supposed to ask the class, you know, who's a skydiver? <laughs> so, you know, common sense stuff, common sense. Resources, um, my Moodle server is set up to use email to notify you of anything. In other words, if I forget to give you a homework assignment and I you know, post a homework assignment after the class, I will send it to your email account. So it is very important to make sure your email account is going to forward the messages to your actual account correctly. Because if you miss that part, it means then you won't get the notification uh, from the Moodle server. Uh, Someprofs.org uh, is the official resource for this class. So you have to go there you know, for your um, homework assignments, and other resources. For a class this size, you know, I don't think we can take you know the exams online, but I will check with the lab and see how many people are still in the class, you know, in the first, second, and the final exam. Grading, no makeup submitted work unless it is excused. So people who are sick can potentially make up you know uh, work, you know, like homework assignments and stuff like that. Uh, no makeup work once the solution is disclosed. And I always uh, disclose the solution of homework assignments on the day it is due. If you are sick on that day, you want to call in as early as you can to let me know that you, you, know, you are sick so that I can you know, potentially make some arrangement, like not disclose the solution on that day and defer it by another you know, meeting of the class. Letter grades, you know, this is kind of uh, interesting. I don't think uh, many other classes have this particular standard. Anyone with less than 12.5% or one-eighth of the total score will get an F at the end of the semester. Between one-eighth and three-eighths is a D. Between three-eighths and five-eighths is a C. Five-eighths and seven-eighths is a B. And anyone who has at least seven-eighths of the scores will get an A. But when you look at the histogram of the distribution of the A, B, C, D, F, this class is consistent with the equivalent class at UC, at UC Davis. Yeah. <laughs> so don't look at this and say, oh, this is going to be a pushover class. It's not. I can tell you why. It's a, it, the answer is it's simple. I just don't ask easy questions. Oh. <laughs> so let's start with the hard ones. You know, I'm, Okay. But most of the people actually, you know, I think in past semesters, uh, the majority of the class would get A's and B's. I have more than half of the class getting, you know, A's and B's, and then the other grades are actually, you know, the minorities. Um, this is how the you know, weights are distributed. Uh, all the homework assignments will only add up to 20% of the final grade. The first exam is 20%, the second exam is 20%, and the final exam all by itself is 40%. And some of you is smart and say, oh, so that means I don't have to turn in any homework assignments, flunk the first and the second exam, I just have to ace the final exam and, and I will still get a C in this class and move on to the next class. Theoretically speaking, yes, it is possible. <laughs> I've never seen anyone try that though. <laughs> Um, I would much rather you know, get as much points as possible out of the homework, first and second exam, 
and then you don't have as much pressure in the final exam to do like exceptionally well. I mean, you can get like 50 percent out of the final exam, you still end up with a B. Okay, assuming your homework and the first and the second exam are you know, relatively good, relatively good. So I would do it exactly the opposite of what I just said. <clears throat> and uh, these are the topics, you know, you know, basically things that I will go over in this class. So it's only tentative. Sometimes I go a little faster. Sometimes I go a little bit slower, depending on the questions in the class. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Yep. What's that? Songprofs.org. How does that work again? Um, you just go to the URL, and um, that's the resource. What do you mean by how does that work? Could you show it real quick? I've never yes. done Moodle. I, I'm not sure. Oh, that's exactly. okay because I'm using Moodle exclusively in this class. So you know, every single class we are using it. So right here, um, this is the home page of this class. And after you log in, you will see something about the same, not exactly the same because I'm looking at it from the professor perspective. I can show you what a student would see because I can change my role to a student. And basically, this is what you will see. The center part of the page you know, are the topics. And then you will have other resources on the left and also on the right. Okay. Yep. Um, the final exam is comprehensive, so it does include all the topics from the beginning of the semester. It's a programming class, so it's, it's really hard not to be comprehensive. You know, you know all the concepts you know, just kind of stack up, so it's really hard not to be uh, comprehensive in a class like this. Okay. All right, so we are done with um, the syllabus, and you have a homework assignment. So I just want to show you, you know, how to navigate in Moodle, and you can see that, you know, in upcoming events, there is one item. Okay, this is your homework assignment. You can also see the due date. The due date in this case is Tuesday, the 30th of August. Basically, you have one week to complete the homework assignment, and the time that you have to turn it in by is 10:30 a.m. on that day. So you basically have to turn it in before the class. But there are several ways to find your homework assignments. This is one, this is the most handy way to find out, okay, do we have an exam coming up? Do we have homeworks coming up? And so on and so forth. I think it looks ahead you know, for two weeks at least. You can also find it in the calendar, the next item. You know, if, when you see a particular day being highlighted, like the 30th, you can hover the pointer over that and it will show you that you know, there's a homework assignment due on that day. You can also go to activities. You can click on assignments, and you can see that you know open office, library office is a homework assignment, and the due date is you know, the 30th of August. I have just shown you what three ways to find your homework assignment, and there's one more. The other way is to go to the topics. Okay, you can see that it is the same thing here. So right off the bat, you know, there are many, many ways to find your homework assignments, but I would just use the upcoming event, you know, because that's really is the best way to do it. Any questions at this point? Let's click, yeah, go ahead. How are we turning it in? Ah, uh, good question. So let me do the homework assignment, and you know, basically you, you should do about the same thing. Okay, so we'll go ahead and click on the homework assignment. I can click, you know, any place, any of the four places, you know, it will still bring me to the homework assignment. So I'll just click this one here. Oh, let me go back. It's better to use right click and open as a new tab so I don't lose the original page. And this is your homework assignment. Let me bump up the font size. <coughs> Download this file and edit it. I suggest that you use right click and then save it. Does everybody understand what I mean by right click and then save the file? Make sure you remember where you save the file because sometimes you know the browser does not ask you where do you want to save the file. By default, Firefox will save it to the download folder in your home folder. Um, next, you want to edit the spreadsheet. You are required to use either Open Office Calc or Libre Office Calc to edit the spreadsheet. You can go here, which is a hyperlink to download and install Libre Office on your computers. Or go here to install LibreOffice Portable to a, removal, to a removable drive. What that means is if you have one of those thumb drives with, I think, it might take up like 300 megabytes or something like that, not really a whole lot. 
But the nice thing of the portable version is, once you install it on a thumb drive, you can take that thumb drive and plug it into any computer, and then you can run OpenOffice on that computer. So it gives you that kind of flexibility. The first option is not portable. Each installation is local only to the computer that you, ins that you installed it onto. But since it is open source, you don't have to pay anything. So you can do it on as many computers as you want. You know, there's no, um, nothing that you have to pay for that. The second option, you know, I just said that, is portable. And you can use it on any computer. So it makes it pretty handy because you just have to find a computer on campus, log in, plug in your USB thumb drive, and you're in business. The spreadsheet will ask you about three things. Um, your first name, your last name, and your declared major. So I can, I'm gonna use it as, you know, as, as a tool to find out you know, how many people are in computer science, electrical engineering, and so on, math, and so on. Um, then you save the document, and then you close LibreOffice Calc, because you want to close the document before you upload it. Just in case you make some additional changes, you know, it will also be saved. Then you use the upload interface that you see below this assignment description to upload the file, and that's it. And the upload interface is down here. So let me just do the homework assignment once so that you can see exactly how to do it. It's all being screen captured, and the screen capture will be on YouTube you know, after this class. Well, sometime you know, this evening I will upload it. All right, so we'll go here, right click, save, I guess. And I'll put it into my download folder. You can put it into any folder that you want to download it to. So save. Now that the document is saved, you can click um, the download the file, you know, if you want to, to open it. And this is the document. Let me zoom in a little bit. It's a spreadsheet. Um, can I make the assumption that most of you know how to navigate in a spreadsheet? how to enter you know, text and numbers in the spreadsheet program. It's okay? We're not gonna use equations in the spreadsheet. No formula, no equations. We just use a spreadsheet as a big table, and that's, that's, the, that's how we use a spreadsheet in this class. Okay, so your homework assignment is just to put in your first name, your last name, and you know, type in your declared major. And you're done. Well, halfway done, because you have to save the document and then we up and then you have to upload it. So I will do exactly the same thing. I'm going to save the document, close the spreadsheet program, go the way, go all the way down to the bottom of this homework assignment until you see you know choose a file to upload, and then we have to navigate to that folder which is download, downloads. Locate the document, which is where is it? Right here. And don't forget to click upload this file. Okay, because what I just did is to specify which file that I want to upload, but it has not been uploaded yet. So you have to make sure that you click upload this file. And Moodle will confirm that it has received your file. File uploaded successfully, and your homework is turned in. So, you know, it's multi-step, you know, it's a multi-step process, you know, but I think you guys can, can do it. And you have a whole week to do it. You have a whole week to think about your declared major if you don't have one yet. Yes? So you don't really care about the file name or anything? Nope, I don't care about the file name, you know, because, um, when you turn in your homework, you have to log in as you anyway. So I know exactly who turned in which file, and you know the entire class can turn in exactly the same file name, and I can still tell you know, whose uh, assignment is whose. Yep. Any other questions at this point about the homework assignment? This one is only worth five points, which is not a whole lot of points, but I want to make sure that people have the necessary tools to do homework assignments in this place, in this class. Yep. Because I use certain features in uh, Calc, and I do not use Microsoft Windows at home. They are fairly compatible, except you know um, when you try to do it in Excel, it does lose some of the information that I want to track. 
So that's why you know using Excel is not uh, an option. I tried it already, so I know for sure that Excel does lose you know some of the tracking information that I want to keep. So we will be required to use that screen for the entire class. Sorry? We will be required to use that entire screen. Yep. Mm -hmm. But it's free. You know, it's not a that you just download and install it. Um, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space, and the way it works is very similar to Excel. The older versions of Excel, you know, Excel 2003, has about exactly the same um, user interface. Any other questions? No other questions? All right. Well, once you turn in your homework assignment, it will also tell you that you turn it in on a particular day. And depending on how I set it up, you can turn it in again and again. In other words, if you forget to enter one of those fields and you turn it in, you can turn it in again. I can I let you turn it in as many times as you want before the due date. Okay? Now on the other hand, if you say, well, the last file that I turn in is not the one that I want. I, you know, I actually want to turn in the file before the last one that I turn in. There's no way for me to retrieve it because when you upload a new version, it overwrites the previous version. Any questions about that part? Yep. Is the, is the homework already live? Hmm? Did you do it already? Yeah, did you already do it? How I'm, to do it? I'm on the website right now and I don't see the homework assignment. Okay, so you're done? No, you're trying to do it. No, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to check if it's there. I can't find it. It should be there already. <laughs> did you, do you see this link here? No, it's not there. It says no upcoming events. No upcoming events. Are you in CISP 300? Because you, if you take multiple classes from Moodle, then you can be in the wrong class. I don't have Are you on the wait list? No. So you're already in the class. Let me let me see if I can see what you see. Um, what's your last name? B, 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 okay. okay. Is that you? Yeah. And one cool thing about Moodle is I can log in as you, but not when I'm a student myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have to, so I have to return to my normal role first. Awesome. Okay, now we're talking. So now we can go here and I can log in as you. And, oh, you haven't clicked the site policy yet. Yeah. What was that? Did, did it prompt you for the site policy? No. no? That's kind of odd, you know, because that... I just let me log in. Okay, well... It looks know. like just not logging to the page. Oh, are you using Internet Explorer? No, Safari. Safari? Okay, so now I just logged in as you and I just went to the, and just going to the class. Oh, it's saying unavailable to students. That is odd. <laughs> <laughs> because it shows here, but it says it's not available to students. Okay, let me fix that. Thank you for the, uh, for the heads up. Okay, let's find out why it's not available. Well, first of all, I put it into the in I put it to the to be deleted you know folder. So that wasn't the wrong place to put the category, right? I think. <laughs> Fortunately, the administrator is also myself, so you know I have not uh, flushed the uh, the toilet yet, so to speak. So, all right. So try that again. I think it should be accessible now. <laughs> Things like that happen when you have so many classes on the list. Okay, but let me know if you still have uh, problems accessing the homework. I think it should be accessible now. All right, well, we, I think we are ready to move into the actual content of this class. But before that, I have to take role because I have to find out how many people are not here. And I have a really cool way of taking role. I try to print out you know, the, the role sheet you know, so we can just pass it along and it won't take up any class time. Unfortunately, the printer was not very cooperative this morning and I could not get it printed.
So what I'll do is I'm going to make a homework assignment for taking roles. Oh, it's it's this is cool. So I will add an activity. I will, I will add a offline activity to take role. So we'll just say this is role on day 23. And the grade, I can turn it to role calling results. And I don't need any beginning and end date. And this will fall into the role category. Now I can take role. And the nice part is I can uh -huh. point to a name <laughs> instead of trying my best, trying my best to pronounce the names correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so is a uh, I'll here. Okay. Now sometimes you have to be careful because sometimes I click the wrong one. <laughs> so you want to make sure that I click the right deal option here. Okay, is okay, thank you. If you like to pronounce your name so that the rest of the class know how to pronounce your name, you can feel free. Okay, Bern, Tristan, okay. Cameron, okay, thank you. Wade, thank you. Nicole, thank you. Sanjung. I wish, you know, Moodle, instead of having, the, in, in addition to the picture, now you guys can change your uh, avatar, so that you know you can you know, put a picture or something that you like. As long as it's not offensive, it's okay. If it is offensive, I'm gonna change it to something that I choose. <laughs> 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 that will not be offensive except to that person. <laughs> okay, how about Aaron? Thank you. But I wish they have a, another um, option here to you know have a little audio clip so that people can you know, pronounce their names and have it stored. Then I can just click it, and you know the system will you know <laughs> name that person. <laughs> Alexis, okay, thank you. David, David Curtis, he's not here. Okay, Ian, okay, uh, Miguel, thank you, Michael, Michael Elgin, or oh, Elgin, not here. Right, um, Vladimir. Jonathan, thank you. Um, Brianna, thank you. Chris, Christ, Christina, Christina, Christina. Okay, thank you. Ben, thank you. Raymond, oh, okay. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to see it. Um, is it Red? Thank you. If I mispronounce your name, let me know. <coughs> Kenneth? Here. Thank you. Christopher? Here. Thank you. Andrew? Yep. Thank you. Ryan? Here. Thank you. Dylan? Here. Thank you. John is here. Um, Sean? Thank you. Matthew? Here. Thank you. Um, Daria? And moving down the list. Anthony? Thank you. Jimmy. Here. You. Terry. Junwei. Thank you. Mikel. Here. Kim. Not here. Luan. Thank you. Is it a uh, Kuro? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cody. Hong Zhu, here, and Jay, here. thank you. And the other thing that's nice about this way of taking role, once it, once, when it comes back, is I can sort by attendance. So I can sort by grade in this case, and I can tell right away that we have three spots open. You know, at the end of the class, you know, the first three person or the first three uh, people on the wait list that are you know, present in the class will get a permission number. The rest of the people on the, on the wait list can keep coming to the class in the, until you get a spot. Um, but I just cannot add you to the class you know, right away. You can also give me your student ID or send an email with your student ID and your name. I can create an account for you manually. 
and add you to the class manually so that you can actually do the homework. But you won't actually get a, a grade of this class until you are officially on the roster. Do you guys understand what I mean? Especially people on the wait list. So I can make you, I can make an account, I can make it so that you can participate in all the homework you know, in this class, but until you're officially on the roster, you are actually not getting a grade out of this class. Is that okay? Okay. All right, so role taking is done. And we are moving on to the first topic. This is you know, actually a fairly fuzzy topic, you know, which means it's not really hard um, stuff. And for those of you who want to read ahead of me, feel free. Okay, all the links you know down here, they are basically all you know topics that we will have to cover in this class. So you, if you feel that you know it's oh this class is moving so slowly and so bored, you can read ahead of me and try to you know um, you know get ahead of the class by reading you know the additional content. But we'll start a little bit here because not everybody knows what is a developer, what is an algorithm, and so on and so forth. So we'll start with this one. And we want to look at this frame only. There we go. Yep. Oh, sorry. Sorry, do you mind if I record this? Um, I don't mind, but it's also being recorded right now. It it's always good to have a yeah, yeah backup. <laughs> oh, I gotta show you guys this. You know, it's, it's not related to the class, <laughs> but this is how I keep the class awake. You know, is to show things that are not exactly related. Okay, so and this is this is really cool because I can look at. And double check. In so, past, do you know what I'm doing? We'll get to double check to make sure. This I'm playing the same file that I'm recording to the right nice now. Part about in HTML this is the earlier part of the class. The but I'm bringing this up, you know, because you know, occasionally, once in a while. I get you know questions like, can you just repeat the last two sen sentences, right? And I have no idea what I just said. Okay, I cannot <laughs> remember what I said. I mean, you know, what I what I said is out already, and you know, I'm not retaining that in my head. Think of all the memory requirement if I have to remember everything that I said, right? <laughs> so, so, so one day, you know, one person actually asked a question: Can you just repeat what you said in the past, you know, two minutes or something like that? And I could not remember what I just said. And I just thought, well, I guess it won't you know, do any harm if I go back to the video clip and see if I can play that portion, replay that portion, even though it is still ongoing and it's still recording. And it worked. So think of it as TiVo. You can actually TiVo back a few seconds <laughs> you know, and, uh, and replay a portion of the video that is still being recorded. Okay. Of course, it can also t uh, call, you know, lead to a uh, confusion, you know, like time loop kind of thing. You know. <laughs> So let's not do it very often. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll destroy the fabric of you know, space and time, and that would not be good. <laughs> All right. So we'll go back and talk about computer and computers and software and stuff like that. Now, the performance of electronic and digital computers have improved dramatically over the short period of about 50 years. Um, how fast are computers? Or how should I put it? What is the pace of the improvement? of you know, electronic equipment like computers and stuff like that. Exponential. It's exponential, very good. Exponential means you know it is not linear. But how fast or what is the pace of the improvement? It doubles every 12 or 18 months. It doubles every 18 months. That's Moore's law. Okay, M-O-O-R-E is Moore and that person basically predicted that we will be able to double the speed of a computer of the same price and same you know, same price point every 18 months. How many 18 months do we have in 50 years? <laughs> well, 50 divided by 1.5, you know, let's call that what 30, okay? The 45 divided by 1.5 is 30. So 30 doesn't seem to be a big number, but remember this is exponential. So the actual improvement over 45 years is 2 to the power of 30. 
okay? Approximately how much, uh, what is the amount that we are talking about here? Two to the power of 30. It's one gig, one, one billion, okay? So in 45 years, computers have, you know, improved its performance um, basically one billion times, okay? But there's a problem in this theory. So we are talking about you know, computers like laptop computers and desktop computers and stuff like that. How much would you pay for a desktop computer you know, like that one? A few hundred bucks, right? Do you think you can buy a computer for a hundred, uh, for a hundred bucks or a few hundred, for a few hundred bucks um, back 45 years ago? <laughs> I'll give you a transistor, right? Oh wait, they don't even have transistors back then. I'll give you a vacuum tube. <laughs> okay, so that's but, but but that shows you how fast things have progressed over time. The hardware of electronic computers have progressed tremendously over the past fifty, you know, forty to fifty years. There's no question about it, and the trend will continue. Okay, every time you know you you know you, you see oh the performance of computers is hitting a, a dead end because we cannot make transistors any smaller. They'll find some other way to make it faster. Multi-core, multi-threading, hyper-threading are all technologies to make things go faster without reducing the size of transistors. And interestingly, they have overcome every single obstacle that you know, people would say, oh, Moore's Law is going to run out of gas to, you know, this year. Nope, they find a new way to make it go faster. Okay. <clears throat> what about software? What do you think, uh, have, how much changes have we done to software or programming with computers over the past 50 years? There has been some improvements, okay? But not nearly the same amount or as significant as hardware improvements. So that's the interesting thing, okay? Because you know, if you understand how to write programs, you know, that knowledge will be useful for the foreseeable future. Okay. So we now talk about software. Now most of you already know what software is because it is the quote unquote opposite of hardware. Hardware is easy to see because it is physical. Anything that you can touch, anything that you can see, anything that you can break would be hardware. I guess you can break software too, but you know. But physically breaking it. <clears throat> Hardware components are important to the operation of a computer because without the hardware, software really does not make a whole lot of sense. But we'll fix that concept in this class because we run software without computers all the time. What are we talking about? Well, think about you know, you know, all the, that half an hour that you were tri you're driving around the parking lot to find an empty space. You were executing an algorithm. I'm not kidding, you were, okay? You're using you know, some particular logic to tell you what to do. You have conditional statements, okay? If I see a spot open, I will park my car into there and end the loop. I'm, I'm not gonna go to drive around the parking lot once I find a, you know, a parking space. That's an algorithm. If I give you a deck of playing cards that is shuffled, how many people think that I'm fairly confident that I can you know, sort it? I, I can tell you, you know, exactly how to order that. How many people think that you will be able to sort a deck of cards that's shuffled? Okay? And by doing that, guess what? You're running a, an algorithm. Okay? So we run algorithms, you know, all the time, except we don't think of those as programs, but they really are. Now, how well can you write a program depends on how well can you capture the logic of doing something and express that you know, clearly to another person, or in this case, to the computer. In other words, if you see a kid you know, who does not know how to sort a deck of cards, how well can you explain the procedure to that kid? That's programming, okay? It's not just that you know how to do it, but you also have to express the logic of doing it. Now, kids are a little bit different because they already understand a lot of concepts that the computer does not understand. So teaching a kid how to do you know, something typically is easier than telling the computer of how to do it. 
convincing the kid that you have it has to be done now is another story. I know how to do it, but I don't want to do it. The computer will do it when you ask it to do it, most of the time. <clears throat> so without available uh, software, the best hardware is nothing more than a heater. Okay, you know, you can buy the best computer there is, you know, from Fry's, you know, you know, soup it up to no end. If you don't have any hard uh, software to run on that computer, you can turn it on and uh, keep yourself warm in the winter. <laughs> and they don't even do that very well these days anymore because the processors are getting so efficient. Um, you know, what is the what is the power dissipation of a of an i7? 150 watts or something like that. Sorry. 137, so you know, pretty much you know, that ballpark, 150 watts or so. Um, what was the last time you have a, a heater, a space heater, that has 150 watts? It's missing one zero, right? So they don't even make good you know, space heaters anymore. In the good old days, you know, we have hot processors, and they, 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 they help to heat up you know, rooms and stuff. <clears throat> so this is something that we just talked about, too. Software is really the specification of how hardware components should operate. Because without those instructions, your hardware doesn't know what to do or you know, how to perform a particular task. And software is really just the instructions so that you know, the hardware can do it. In a more specific definition, software is the specification of how a processor in a computer should operate. Okay? How many processors do you think you have in a, in a typical computer these days? There are many, okay? Now you have the main processor that you guys know already, you know, the i3, i5, i7, um, you know, AMD, Intel processor. That's your main processor. Yes, that's definitely a processor. What about your graphics card? The graphics card has specialized processors, okay? So what else do you think inside the case of a, of a PC has its own processor? Yep. Your hard drives, okay? Your hard drive typically has at least two or three processors, um, and they have dedicated you know, functions. How about your CD-ROM, CD-ROM drive, your optical drive? It has its own processor, okay? Because you can recode it you know, with respect to the region code. There are ways you can do you know, and make it not, you know, not uh, you can change the region code of your uh, CD-ROM, and you can some, in some cases, you can change the firmware to do a lot of uh, interesting things with your CD-ROM drives. Let's just leave it at that. Okay, so it's everywhere. I mean, you do have a lot of processors, not just the main processor. At the core hardware level, processors can perform only simple operations. Your processor natively know how to add numbers, how to subtract numbers, how to compare numbers, multiplication, division, and some conditional branches, you know, which I won't cover in this class. But nonetheless, those are all you know, very simple instructions. Okay? Natively, it can only do very simple things. It is the software which consists of billions and billions of instructions to make it do something more complicated. Okay, so all the complicated things that we can do with a computer, when you break it down to the lowest level, each instruction can only do a little bit. Okay, it's not much. You won't see the lowest level of instructions in this class. You won't see in the next class CISP 360, but if you take CISP 310 assembly language programming, we will actually examine you know, the, the, the smallest block of, the smallest building block of programs. And that's kind of interesting because it is almost the same as building a castle using grains of sand. Okay, so you have the little tweezer and you know, you know, glue, and now you're building a castle, a real size castle, using grains of sand. Okay, it seems to be impossible, but it is actually doable because as long as you wrote, as long as you write your program in a structured way, you can make small blocks. And in software, we can replicate, okay? We can say, oh, I like this structure here. It's really tiny, but let's replicate it like, you know, 500 times. That's easy to do in software. Once you have these things, you can build bigger blocks and then bigger blocks and then bigger blocks. Okay, so in that class, we will actually use assembly uh, language to write, you know, fairly complicated algorithms. This slide basically just talks about, you know, how software is everywhere. 
Okay, and this is already kind of archaic because I did not mention much about you know smartphones, tablets, and some of the devices that we use you know daily, you know by today's standard. Um, basically, what it means is, um, well, I use you know one example here that's kind of interesting, and some of you are way too young to remember what Furbies are. <laughs> okay, now how do I know Furbies have software has you know has a processor inside and is running some kind of software? What can Furbies do? Hmm? <laughs> yes, they can do that very well, but there are other things they can do, you know, that without a processor. So what do you think that what what do you think uh, is a is a clue that makes me think Furbies actually have processors <coughs> inside? Yep. It can process uh, ambient noise. It can process ambient noise and it can teach each other what they have learned. Okay, so you can have your Furby and then you talk to it and it learns your vocab, right? I have my Furby and I'll talk to it and it will learn my vocab. But when you have the two Furbies and point them to each other, they would use IR communication and they would actually exchange, you know, what they have learned. It's kind of creepy, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's, you know, how much is a Furby when it was hot? 20 bucks, 30 bucks or something like that? So a 20 to 30 dollar toy, and this is what, you know, five, ten years ago, can use a processor. So you can imagine what kind of stuff we can do now with, you know, processors. How much do you think is a processor? The simplest time. 50 cents. 50 cents, that is correct. Okay? You can actually get a processor with, you know, and it's, it's not just the processor. It has its own RAM, its own flash memory, and everything. You just give it, you know, power, and it will work for fifty cents. Now we are assuming that we, we are buying in like ten thousand or twenty thousand quantities. But when you're making Furbies, you know, you typically would go through, you know, batches of, you know, probably hundreds of thousands. So it is entirely possible now to integrate processors and also software design into just about anything. Okay, think your backpack. Okay, how would you? integrate, you know, a processor to make your backpack smart. <laughs> well, I think you can at least, you know, put a photo sensor to it and, you know, an LED blinker. So when you go out at night, it senses the surrounding is dark enough, it will automatically turn on the LED, you know, so it will blink. <coughs> okay? You can put in a um, proximity sensor. So if, it's, if someone tries to jump you from behind, your backpack, your backpack will give you a warning. <coughs> you can hook it up to a pepper spray device to <laughs> automatically <laughs> defend yourself. It's all possible now, okay? It's all possible. Well, it has been possible for a long time, except you know, 10 years or 20 years ago to do something like that, you would need a big battery pack and you know, the cost of doing this is going to be running up to hundreds of dollars. Now, you can do it in probably 10, 20 bucks, tops. Yeah. But don't bring your experimental your backpack with your know, auto pepper spray in the class, okay? I just don't want any accidents in the class. <laughs> that could be a, a little uh, disruptive. Just a little. Hmm? Just a little. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah, load it up with water. Uh, don't load it up with a pepper spray. <laughs> All right. So, so we have just you know talked about how hardware is everywhere because they are so inexpensive, and the performance is, is really so good. Uh, we talked about you know you need software in order to make the hardware useful. So the next question is who's going to do it? Who's going to do the dirty job? Well, you just you know, you're just reading it. It's developers and computer scientists. Okay, there's a slight difference between the two, but they're both responsible to develop the software that go into these hardware devices. And this is also a good time to show you how developers are important to even the biggest you know software company in the world. Well, at least at the time it was you know the largest. So we'll go to YouTube and we look for developer, developers, developers. And I don't need to say anything because I can quote um, Steve Ballum. This is going to be fun too. 
And after this, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something that's even more interesting. Developers, 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 developers. This is a remix version. I want to find the one that is not remixed. <laughs> because you know, the, because once it's remixed, you don't know exactly you know, how many times he said it. Because it can be you know, just a remix effect. So let me see if this is the developers, one. Developers, developers, this is developers, the one. developers, 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 developers. Developers, 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 yeah. Is he sweating? He's sweating, he's panting. Like that dog? Yeah. So, hmm? He's preaching. Yeah, scary. Yeah, he's the CEO of Microsoft. Oh, that's why that's okay. Yep, he is in charge of, uh, yep, Microsoft. Okay, so that kind of shows you the importance of developers, because without developers, what use you know, what what is the use of a computer without software? Not very useful. Okay, but in this class, you will learn that we don't need just developers; we need good developers. <laughs> okay, and that's the difference here. Okay, um, you know, throughout this class, I'm kind of running out of time. But throughout this class, I will explain you know, all the other things that you need in order to become a good developer, okay? And not just a developer. And most of that has to do with math and logic, logical thinking, and stuff like that. Um, many people ask, you know, well, why do you have to talk about so much math in a programming class? Well, it's because it, makes you, it is a necessary ingredient to become a good programmer, a good computer scientist, and so on. Okay, and to close that without offending anyone but myself, I'll use this example. Okay, how many of you think that I'll have a chance of being an NBA player? <coughs> what do you mean by not? You know, I mean I can I can shoot a basketball. I can run around in a basketball court for you know twenty seconds or so. Yep. Hmm. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think any of those will make me any taller. Yeah. <laughs> so even if I'm a good shooter, I'll be blocked, right? And it's the same thing with programming. Okay, just because someone can copy and paste code from a book does not mean that person can be a good programmer or a good developer. Okay, it's the same thing. But instead of physical height and fitness, there are other things that you know that makes a, a person good at programming. So we'll talk about that, you know, when we come back on uh, Thursday. And before we leave, I do want to point out that you should read this section here. Finish up, you know, developers and algorithms, and also get started with variables, expressions, and sequences. This is you know, the starting point of the actual programming concept. The other ones is just you know, for me to illustrate why it is important. But this is the, the starting point of the technical stuff. So definitely get started with this one. Read ahead of me. And if you have questions, bring the questions to the class. So when we talk about those concepts, then you can ask those questions. All right? Any other questions? All right, I'll see you guys on Thursday. And don't forget the homework assignment, which will take you about two minutes. That was due on Tuesday. Let's do one next Tuesday. Exactly. <laughs>